This is Off to Off Topic, a show where two men with the attention spans of a squirrel try and fail to stay on topic with the day's subject. Where will their oral meanderings take us? Well, stick around and listen, because today's Off to Off Topic Topic is... Elvira Part 4, and the final part in our series. Today we're going to talk about her movies, her relationships, and what major event of the 1980s that nearly ruined her mentally. But first, an Elvira fun fact. Fun Elvira fact. Virtually every convention or signing she does, there'll be one pot middle-aged dude in a trucker hat who sings Elvira by the Oak Ridge Boys to her. She hates that song because this happens so often. So stop it. Does she stop them? Uh, what, does she stop them? No, yeah. I don't think she does because, you know, that'd just be rude and angry. Because they always, yeah. like, sashay up with this look in their eyes like, ooh, this is clever and this is going to make her interested in me or something like that. You know, they're like, nobody's ever done this before. And they'll start singing and she just kind of, like, just stares at them with this dead look in her eyes. Yeah, that would be obnoxious. <laughs> yeah, and it happens so often, she says. She's just tired of that song. It's almost like that joke people give. I, I I try not to. I don't try. It's not that hard to not try. But uh, you, oh, the someone so, someone tries to scan something in the register and it doesn't scan. Like oh, the free ha yeah, ha right. ha. Guess that means it's free. <laughs> her her her. And you can see the register uh, person working register be like huh. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah uh, no, yeah. That's exactly how that works. Way. It's obviously free. <laughs> uh. Well, Elvira's career was going great, one thing would arrive to bring turmoil to her private life. Remember how she's friends with every gay man she meets and drag queens and all this and that? Well, here comes the AIDS epidemic. Sadly, she saw many good friends of hers waste away to what they first called gay pneumonia, then gay cancer, and finally AIDS. And a few other things they called her over the years, but those are the ones she mainly referenced. Also, her sisters had become bad ag- addicts with drugs and alcohol at the time and constantly in and out of rehab and jail. Naturally, all this stress took its toll on Cassandra, and she started drinking heavily to fight off uh, the depression, and to fight off the hangovers the next day, she would turn to cocaine to help with those. So now she's a heavy drinker and a heavy cocaine user just to get through the uh, day. Yeah. That sucks. This quickly leads to anxiety, paranoia, and something she's never experienced before but all, but only heard about. She starts getting her first panic attacks, which I've never had, but I hear they're awful. They're awful. I've had them plenty of times. Eventually, Cassandra was uh, convinced she was being stalked because she was having such bad panic attacks. And at one point, she flat out passed out at a grocery store because she thought somebody was following her. This was her sign to start seeing a therapist and get some real medication. And uh, she wasn't on the cocaine and booze too long, but uh, the therapist, that did help. So the medication. She started cutting out the drugs and uh, bringing her drinking back in check. 1986 was a huge year for Elvira character. They secured syndication rights for the movie Macabre, making her the first horror host to be televised throughout the USA. Uh, before all the horror hosts were just like little local guys. Boop, boop, boop. And uh, her being syndicated actually did lead to a little confusion early on as because uh, the show looked so low budget. People were starting to assume, hey, this must be local to us. You know, so people in like Ohio were like, obviously, the cell virus is a local character. Look how crappy it's made. Nothing like that could come out of L.A. or anywhere else. And that, I mean, that would work. I mean, especially you know, back then, it wasn't there's was no Internet. You know, people were like, yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. So everyone can think. Like this Elvira person, it, she's my, uh, not mine, but like she's ours. You know, she belongs in, uh, I don't know, uh, fucking, I don't know, look, Unicorn, uh, Ohio. Like us uh, here in the small town of Unicorn, Ohio, you know, we're, we have this local celebrity called Elvira. We don't know where she lives, but. And then there's that like one kid who's really into horror movies off in the corner be like, no, no, she's from LA. And everybody's like, shut up, kid. Yeah. She's ours. Burn him. Yeah, yeah, right. He's like, but no, I have these horror magazines. They talk about stuff. Why are these horror magazines stuck together? Ha! <laughs> uh, and not on the pages you're expecting either. Right! <laughs> Meanwhile, the Elvira page is untouched. Yeah, ha! <laughs> uh, that page with the gremlins on it completely messed up. Right. <laughs> yeah, why are the critters just crusty? <laughs> uh... Yeah, uh, when she went syndicated, she actually got a lot of complaints from the Bible Belt due to her outfits and boobs. Of course also, they did. Her highest ratings were from the Bible Belt, probably because of, course of they her were. outfit and boobs. Yep. <laughs> I know when I read that, I'm like, well, that's one of the least surprising things I've read in this entire Right. <laughs> yeah, apparently the uh, station manager would get all sorts of complaints from the Midwest being like, cover up that cleavage, make that leg less visible, and so on and so forth. So, in the uh, time-honored tradition, whenever the boss would show up and tell the crew, hey, fix that, they would look at him and be like, sure thing, boss. And then they would absolutely do nothing. And if the boss came back and was like, did you get that done? They'd be like, sure did, boss. And he'd be like, all right, whatever, and just head up back and do his thing. 
And that cycle would basically go on for the rest of the show's run. I mean, let's look the biggest hit in any religion, in any, like uh, just throw a dart. It doesn't matter who they are. If they have hardcore conservative beliefs in terms of like people cover themselves up or whatever. And I mean, again, across the world, across all mixed models and religions, it, if the harder they complain, the more they're into it. And so it's just, yep. They're confused by what they like, and it makes them angry. <laughs> yeah, of course. No shit. Like, yeah. I mean, by God. I remember there was one thing where, um, I think Pornhub released, and I'll probably get this wrong, but I mean, this the it stands. I'm not going to try to guess the areas, even though I, I think I know where they are, but I'm, I might be wrong. There are areas in the world where they shut down porn, like, okay, we can't do porn anymore, and Pornhub released, like, all the illegal, all these streams are going, and it was just, just the sickest shit. You know, yeah, like gay porn all up in like the anti-gay areas. It was just, I don't know. And none of this is surprising at all. If you've not lived a life even at all. a little bit, not even remotely. Yeah, 1986 was actually a pretty year, big year for Elvira because she also made the MTV special Elvira in Salem, and this was also the time of her first comic book run for Elvira in DC Comics. It was Elvira House of Mystery. <laughs> And uh, she would actually go on to be in a lot of comic books over the years. Her own little, like, miniseries and stuff. Be like, Elvira's Horror Series. Never any, like, long-running ones, but you know how those go. Right. This was also the year Elvira would be a guest at WrestleMania 2, where she'd do some guest commentating. And I think she was a ring girl, too, for, like, the main event. She said it was a fun experience, and all the wrestlers were really sweet to her. And as Cassandra, she got a role in the movie Alan Quartermain in The Lost City of Gold, playing Queen Solaris. And I remember seeing that movie back in the day. And did you ever see uh, Alan Quartermain? No, Indiana no. Jones knockoff, basically. No, uh, yeah, one. yeah. I know who fun... he is. I just, I can't. I don't know if I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. It's a fun movie, worth watching. I would think. Of course, I haven't seen it in forty years, but thirty years. Hmm. Well, I'm, anyways, I remember there was one. Let's see, there was a, there was a, was it? Ah, uh, there are two movies that came out that were very similar. There was another one with Michael Keaton, not Michael Keaton, Kirk Douglas. I always get those two confused. Um, Michael Keaton? Not Kirk Douglas. Michael Douglas. Michael okay. Douglas, not Kirk. <laughs> I knew this was Douglas. Damn it. Michael Douglas. And he was an adventurer. It was, there was a, Dane DeVito was in it. Oh, Romancing the Stone. Yes. Romancing yes. the Stone, Jewel of the Nile. Uh, yep. Those the, are actually and, pretty good too, to be honest. I like those. Yeah, and well. I, I thought, I remember there was like a knockoff of that. And I, it might have been the quarter. Of course, Quartermain is probably, I think he quarter, that character has been around longer. Quartermain is one of those, he goes back to like the, I don't know, late 1800s pulp books or something yeah, like that. And yeah, yeah. And I think it was one of those two, like the whole Romancing the Stone and Jewel of the Nile was big hit. So they're like, hey, let's just go pull some public domain character out and write about him. Yeah, a year after. Um, yeah. Uh, Romancing the Stone, 85. And... Okay, so anyway. That's we got track, but yeah, that's that's who I think of when I think of a uh, 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 the quarterman guy. And I'm gonna say no, I haven't seen it. If I have, it is no longer in the. They can't find the file. In the huh. brain, so <laughs> uh, somebody shredded it a while back in order to make room yeah. for other stuff. Even though it was the same year, it got uh, approved for syndication later that year in 1986 would also be the final run of uh, Movie Macabre. 140 episodes of the show is made overall. And uh, even though the show ended, still, you know, Elvira was being syndicated everywhere and doing a whole lot of other stuff. So her career was far from over. And also the fact, remember, she owns her character outright, which is pretty cool. That, man, I that may, I have mad respect for that. Yep, like that me too. That's good. 1986 would also see Coors Beer come a-knocking. Coors wanted to turn Halloween into a big drinking holiday for adults. And uh, with their initial efforts, they came out with the Coors Wolf for Halloween. And that one failed. It was a very dumb mascot. It was basically a werewolf wearing a baseball cap that was supposed to make you want to buy beer for Halloween. You can look <laughs> it up. There's pictures of him out there. So before canceling the uh, Coors Wolf, they decided to pair him up with Elvira, and they'll be their new Halloween duo. Well, Elvira was a smash hit. The wolf was not, and discontinued shortly thereafter. This uh, celebrity endorsement will also make Elvira the first female celebrity celebrity to endorse a beer ever. That's kind of impressive. That is impressive. Yeah. And this is also where the legendary Elvira cardboard uh, cutout displays would make their debut. Apparently, they were so commonly stolen that cor cores could barely make enough to keep them in circulation. And a uh, funny thing is, too, there's a lot of complaints about them being, quote unquote, too scandalous because Elvira's on there. If you look up pictures of the original ones, they completely cover up her like boobs and cleavage with hair. They're like 
completely not that uh booberific. Okay. <laughs> For some reason, I was thinking like it's totally stupid. Uh, you said the cover with hair, and I imagine like gorilla, like she had a <laughs> yeah gorilla chest hair, like, <laughs> but it's like, uh, like. But that makes more sense. Yeah, her hair comes down. <laughs> Uh, she's just got like a full, they just like photoshopped Robin Williams chest over her with just all that hair. Uh, also, if you want to get one of those cardboard cutouts, you can find them on eBay, but be prepared to pay $200 or more for one. What, what did these come out? They came out in 86, the cardboard cutouts. Let's see. Uh, you can also Google Core's original uh, Elvira cutouts. Meh. I've seen, a, I've seen a lot of like recent, like, hmm. And these, uh, they, there is no hair covering. They are all about, uh, maybe this one. Okay, yep, I see it. Yeah, the hairs, they, they, they did as much, they covered as much as they could with the hair yep, they had. Yep, they did. I mean, you can see a little bit of breasticles there, but. Oh, yeah, much. I mean, it's not gone, like, they acknowledge it there, but yes, they, they Yeah, totally they definitely just, took the cleavage part out of it. Yeah, her hair got extra long for this shot. Y- yeah, so. yeah, you can tell that's not original hair, because it's like, she's got long hair and a beehive hairdo. It's like, mm. <laughs> A lot of hair there. This campaign was massively popular and also ran in October of 87 as well. Then, in 1988, her core's sponsorship came to an end. Why? Well, it's kind of a, a, a surprising one. Why the satanic panic started flying around everywhere. Yes, that whole dumb thing we had to live through in the 80s. So, uh, basically, the whole core's canceling her started out when there's rumors of Procter & Gamble being a satanic conglomerate that uh, was donating all their money to satanic churches and stuff. And all of a sudden, some of the... Uh, Big corporations across America started getting really nervous, namely the ones that were owned by our super religious people. And Coors was one of those. And when their super religious owner uh, got swept up in all this, he immediately saw Elvira and started going, evil, evil. And he took that as a sign that apparently they were becoming a satanic company. So he was like, hey, we're going to fire her, even though she's hella popular. Not not a great business decision there, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, I mean, like, who wants money? Yeah, not <laughs> right? Us. I know it was making the tons of money, and I guess when it was canceled too, everybody in Coors was like shocked. Especially like the uh, promotion guys are like, "Why are you canceling this? This thing is going over like gangbusters." Because their whole plan with this was to turn Halloween into an adult drinking holiday, as much as it was for kids. And uh, judging by how Halloween is nowadays, they kind of succeeded in that, right? Yeah. Well, God never closes the door without Satan opening a window, and here comes Pepsi, who's looking to hype their newest sodas, Mug Root Beer and Mandarin Orange Slice. And they're like, hey, guess what? We don't care if people think we're satanic. We're Pepsi. Come on, Elvira. We'll let you be our new spokesperson. So in 1989 and 1990, Pepsi ran a campaign where people buying those sodas could win the Go Psycho with Elvira contest, where you could win a trip to Universal Studios to attend a party hosted by Elvira. I never liked uh, this. Like, I, I mean, I've never done, I've never even entered, so I'm not saying I, don't, I won one, I didn't like it. I just... I never liked the idea of winning a dinner or winning a party like with a celebrity because basically, wh- what are you, what are you gonna do? You know, it's you, like you gotta go, to, go to a public place and feel publicly awkward around a celebrity you may or may yeah. Not like. That I, I mean, no, thank you, no, thank you. Yeah, you know, it's and then a, a party like so. Is she gonna be your buddy the whole time? Like, you yeah, or does she just show up and be like, "Welcome to my party," and then just disappear in the back and do a mm-hmm. bunch of blow while you just wander around? And be like, I don't know anybody here. I mean, I don't. I just never saw the point. I mean, yeah. it's just. But if you do meet yeah. Elvira, where are you going to be like, so do you like stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's, and it's just like, I mean, I get it if, I don't know, if you're a very a big genre star and you end up getting uh, a neck beard going in there and they're going to give you a third degree. It's like, they're the, they're, I don't know. It's Kevin Sorbo. What the fuck does he know about Hercules? You know, why uh. <laughs> don't to ask him about the writing about it. And, and all he'll do, then all he'll do is like yell his right wing talking points at you. But you know, it's like I don't know for some reason Kevin Sorbo was the first like. I, I was wondering, tier. it was like Kevin Sorbo. Wow, it's a, it was the every... first B tier actor I could think of that was in a genre thing. Wow, so, B B tiers were really generous. Yeah, Sorbo. that's good. That's D a tier. Really, okay, D tier. I'll take. Yeah, his B tier status went away a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, and he was barely B tier. Maybe for a hot moment, people liked him in a. Uh, yeah, for, you're right. For a hot second, back for in the a hot 90s. second, and then Xena came in and just blew him out of the water with a superior show with more tits and ass. Absolutely, the campaign was a success, and when it ran its course, Core showed up hat in hand to offer Elvira her job back with him. Turns out their attempts to replace her with Leslie Nielsen didn't work out so well. 
He played the bumbling detective searching for the Phantom of the Fridge. I vaguely remember that ad campaign, too, because uh, Naked Gun movies were pretty big at the time. And I like those movies. I like Led Lizzie Nielsen, but I also remember those commercials being pretty bad. Yeah, Leslie Nielsen's awesome. I, I yeah. love Leslie Nielsen. Uh, of course, then you go to the Naked Gun movies, and then it's like, oh, his uh, his psychic... Um, <laughs> Let's, let's let's just say he uh, he didn't, cut, didn't turn up too well. Yeah. The second course campaign would be very successful, but also ended suddenly in 1995 with very little explanation. Uh, the best answer uh, Cassandra and her crew was able to get was a combination of a combination of the owners still think you're satanic, and also uh, mothers against drunk driving were targeting Halloween because apparently Coors ads kind of succeeded, and there's a lot more uh, drunk driving wrecks in uh, Halloween area Halloween time. And also, one thing, too, that happened around this time is um, the uh, fame to drop to a 0.08 BAC blood alcohol content for driving. The uh, you can't blow 0.08 or more was passed by Bill Clinton right around that time. Uh, and I remember this happened around that time because I was playing online with a guy, Ultima Online, and he was going off about how he hated that law. And that was going to be the end of all drinking in America. And you won't be able to use mouthwash without getting pulled over and thrown in jail. Oh, that's dumb. Yeah, I mean, this dude was totally he's like, you can't even drink a beer now, and then they'll just round you up and throw you in prison. I'm like, uh, mm. Yeah, and um, I remember seeing some clips where they're like, when they first just, uh, enter, or did the no drinking and driving, like, you can't drink beer while you're driving. And they would all these video, these uh, people interviews going, well, what am I going to do when I get off a long day of work and I want to have a beer on my way home? <laughs> And there was a one lady where she was like in a Volkswagen with the kids in the back. She's like, I think I, right. I want to have a beer while I'm driving. That's my right. Like, Jesus I Christ. got all these screaming kids in the back of my V dub. Are you expecting me to drive around sober? That's not happening. Cause <laughs> I, I, I remember back in the day too, when your dad would just have a beer. Well, maybe not your dad, but my dad would just like drag along a beer or a rum and Coke. Not a great time. Right. It's like, who cares? Whatever. They'll be yeah, all, yeah all they be didn't good. care. Even Elvira well, talks about it in uh, her book. Her dad used to just drive down the road with like a bottle of Jim Beam between the seats and a Coca-Cola. And every once in a while, he'd be like, open me a new Coke, dear. <laughs> One messed up thing that came out of this was the fact that since the start of the Elvira character, she had referred to herself as the Queen of Halloween. And she even called herself that like way back when, when she was a little kid, too, if I recall. Well, Coors liked that moniker. And after the second run with Elvira, they trademarked that line and just stole it from her. They were like, hey, she never copyrighted that or trademarked it. We're going to take that line from her. So then Chorus took the Queen of Halloween and they dubbed Pamela Anderson the new Queen of Halloween. And uh, that's basically who they replaced Elvira with, was Pamela Anderson. And uh, Yeah, and apparently Chorus was even a little more douchey about this than you would think, too, because around that time, Cassandra heard from a local club owner that uh, the club advertised, hey, Elvira uh, is going to be here. You want to hang out with Elvira around Halloween time? And apparently a Chorus representative showed up at that club and told the owner, Hey, if you get rid of Elvira, we'll uh, send Pamela Anderson here with the Coors crew and hook you up with Coors for the night. And uh, yeah, so basically they were trying to like shove out Elvira every place they could or every chance they could get. Apparently the owner of the apparently the owner of the club refused because one, he was El- friends with Elvira, and two, it was a gay club, so nobody cared about Pamela Anderson to be honest. But if they did that one place, I'm sure they did it other ones. I mean, I like Pamela Anderson. I mean, I you know as a uh... Straight male who likes her assets. I mean, it, you know, I was all about some Pamela Anderson, but yeah, I mean, sorry, Elvira's Elvira. Yeah, yeah, you can't really replace Elvira with Pam Anderson. They're two totally different personalities, and Pam Anderson's not made for Halloween, really. No. Yeah, uh, that ad campaign actually went down in flames, too. Oh, did it? Uh, yeah, it actually, Pamela Anderson didn't go over very well, so then after that, they decided to try the new queen of Halloween contest. And they like had a bunch of people like line up and try to try out for it or something like that to make the new cores queen of Halloween. That also failed. Cassandra would get some revenge in 1996 though, when some ex cores guys decided to help her launch her own micro brew Elvira's night brew. This actually made Elvira the first celebrity to market her own beer. It was a dark lager, but I couldn't find any reviews on it and they don't make it anymore. So I couldn't try it. Her trying to make her own beer pissed off cores and they did everything in their power to force her out of the game. And uh, they kind of succeeded, too, as her beer only lasted a year. Like, they would show up to uh, conventions and stuff, uh, like beer conventions and beer tasting events to uh, hype their beer. And all of a sudden, you know, like, the bouncer at the door would be like, well, you can't enter this. Or, you know, the whole event would come up with weird reasons that uh, they couldn't let them attend. So they're just assuming Coors was kind of fucking them over. Yeah. Yeah. 
That just really so, sucks. I mean, what to to what end? You know? Yeah, right. Why does Coors have a vendetta against uh, Elvira? Well, money, I guess. Not a vendetta against her. Yeah. They just want more money. Okay, so we kind of got sidetracked on beer and soda in the 90s, and we need to hop back to the uh, second half of the 80s and talk about the Elvira movie for a moment. Before the movie got made, the crew, uh, the Elvira crew had two options. Get Elvira a sitcom or go for the gusto and get an Elvira movie made. Popularity was high at the time, so they figured the movie would probably be their best option because it's easier to go from being a movie star to a TV star than to go from a TV sitcom to a movie star kind of thing. So, guess who comes into the play right now? Our old buddy Brandon Tartikoff from NBC. Remember him from uh, ALF, A-Team? Yes. Or, uh, yes, that boy, Brandon Tartikoff. Uh, was he the one who killed ALF or he wanted ALF to continue? He wanted ALF to continue and then he okay. got fired in the nine, or right. late 80s or so. He so was ousted. Brandon, mm-hmm. Ousted. Ousted, yes. But at this time, he's still with NBC, cranking out hit after hit. And Brandon Tartikoff was a huge fan of Elvira and more than happy to give her a movie deal. So, Cassandra and her friend and writer John Paragon teamed up with Sam Egan, who is the writer and producer on The Incredible Hulk, Northern Exposure, and The Outer Limits, and they got fast to work on a story. Originally, it was supposed to be closer to a spoof of Wizard of Oz, but uh, eventually it turned into a slightly different kind of of fish-out-of-water story, because the studio was like, eh, eh, we don't really like this idea. Make it more of a comedy kind of thing. More of a comedy, less of a spoof, I guess. Uh, One thing the studio did insist on having was teenagers in the movie. They insist, the studio insisted that teenagers would never go see an Elvira movie if there wasn't teenagers in them for them to relate to. Yeah, uh, just... yeah I know. And Cassandra and her crew were like, that's not true. Look at like the Indiana Jones movie. They just basically listed off a bunch of movies that didn't have a crew of teenagers in it that were super popular. But the studio was like, no, 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 no. It's got to have teenagers for them to relate to. So apparently all the teenagers in that movie were forced in at the last minute. So if they seem kind of weird and tacked on, it's because they were. Yep. Yeah. However, while they're doing auditions, um, one person who auditioned and failed for the role of the lead teenager was actually Brad Pitt before he is like famous for much. Cassandra says that Brad Pitt owes her one for not hiring him and ruining his career before it started. Yeah. Yeah. I think she called it. She called it that one. Uh, I yeah. think she was correct. She is. She is correct. <laughs> and uh, speaking of casting, she wanted to hire as many of her fellow Groundlings actors as she could, trying to, you know, do a solid for her friends. And uh, the problem is, even though you want to give all your friends jobs, sometimes there's not roles for them. So she only managed to get a couple of them roles, which caused some fresh friendships to fall apart. Some of the people that are in the Groundlings like, well, if you didn't get me a role, we're obviously not friends. Here, I'm never going to talk right. to you again. Yeah, which that's kind of dumb because, I mean, they should realize being in the industry that sometimes there's just not a role for you, man. Yeah, I mean, some you're absolutely right. Sometimes it just... Yeah, and it broke up some friendships with her and other comedians. And the sad thing is, Paul Rubens basically went through the exact same thing with Pee-wee's Big Adventure. He was like, hey, I'll try to get all my fellow Groundlings a job in this movie and could only get a few of them. And the ones that didn't get the movie were like... Mm. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, you know what I... Yeah. She did manage to get her parents in a background role, however. I, I think it's in the scene where they're about to burn her at the stake. Her parents are like way off in a corner just hanging out. The actual shooting for the movie was uh, really rough for Cassandra because she wasn't really paying attention when they were writing the script or the screenplay. And she was basically written into every scene in the movie, which means she had long days of shooting. You know, some people would be like, hey, you're not going to be in scene for a while. You can go home. Nope, not Cassandra. She was in pretty much every scene in that movie and... Uh, I didn't realize until I read the book, and yeah, they're right. She is in a lot of that movie. Uh, luckily, though, in order to help uh, dole out the workload a little easier on her, they had a model do some stand-in scenes that didn't involve her face, you know, uh, like her turning the key to the car, you know, little hand stuff, or just like walking in the background. That model had a boyfriend who was a comedian trying to break it through and make it big in New York City at the time. That comedian was Jerry Seinfeld. Uh, Elvira and that model did become fast friends and still work together on occasion when it calls for it, because... I guess she looks like uh, Cassandra. So there you go. We have ancillary connection to Jerry Seinfeld. I I have mixed feelings about Jerry Seinfeld because sometimes he's like, he's hilarious, but then other times it's like, I don't know, man. He seems like a dick. He does seem like a dick. He seems like if you meet him in person, he'd just blow you off. Okay. He seems like a guy who's funny on stage and funny when he's on, but if he's just like hanging out, he's probably not a very funny guy. I have a feeling. I mean, in fair, in fair. I mean, not not all comedians are on all the time, but it just he he strikes me as someone who uh, loves the smell of his own shit. Oh, you know? absolutely. He did. I, I you know I, I will have mad respect to him. He is he's written down every joke he's thought of and saved it. 
Yeah. So he has binders and binders and like uh note little note cards and note cards of, of jokes. So I re- I respect that. He combined all that and made the B movie, the greatest B movie we've ever seen. Oh my god. <laughs> Just, movie based oh my on god. Bees. <laughs> I mean let's I know, I know. Let's have a relationship between a bee and a human. You know, a bee who has none of what is required to mate with any kind of mammal. And also lives very briefly. Well, it's the birds and the bees. And she's a bird, if you're a British person. Hi, bird. What's up? Anyways. Boo. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I deserve that. I deserve to be booed. <laughs> uh, uh, at the end of her show, she'd always comment, it's time to hop in the macabre mobile and take off. But there was no such car in existence. They just used it as an ending line for the show. But for the movie, they actually wanted to make one so she could drive around in it. So they didn't know exactly what kind of car they wanted to use it for and were playing around with ideas. And then one day on her wor- way to work, Cassandra saw a 1959 Ford Thunderbird at a dealership and said, that's it. That's the car I want for the macabre mobile. So she went to production and said, hey, let's get that and make it look spooky. And the production looked at her and laughed and laughed and laughed and said, we do not have the budget to make a running car like that. <laughs> so what they were able to do is buy a junker Thunderbird from a uh, lot and basically make it a non-running prop. There's like no engine, no drivetrain in it. It just looked good, but they had to, you know, tow it around or just roll it around in scenes. That makes sense. Yeah. I'm surprised you can go with a hearse. Uh, I mean, I know it's a little bit too on the nose. Well, but... so I think they want a convertible so they could see her better. Cause uh, fair enough. Yeah. Cause that way her head could be out and that way you'd be like, Hey, that's Elvira there. If it's just well, a hearse, the top I mean, of a hearse. Could... Yeah. Just, big but a, again, uh, I mean, it's hearse. also also rever- like, like I said, it, it, that is t- kind of too on the nose. After shooting, the car would be auctioned uh, off. Later, Cassandra would track it down and buy it back. Then later in 2016, History Channel's Counting Cars would give it a makeover and make it a real running car. However, uh, I saw that episode where they do the makeover, and I think they kind of ruined the car because beforehand it had the, like, this really cool black and white moo cow interior, and um. They replaced it with leopard print interior that just did not look as good to me. And went from like a nice, stunning black and white interior color to a just off brown. Mm. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can look up pictures of the car online. It's a sweet looking car, to be honest. A couple more fun facts from the movie. At uh, one point, you remember that flash dance scene where, you know, the lady dances around then sits in the chair and pulls a little bucket and water comes down and cools her off? Yep. Yep. Well, they redid that scene for this movie. Well, for the recreation, instead of using water, they used a pail of black paint because somebody was pranking her at the end of it. So uh, they used an actual real kind of paint in that. But the problem was they put the bucket way too high up in the air and didn't consider the fact that paint is actually pretty heavy. So when she like plopped back in the chair, threw her head back and pulled down the bu- uh, lever, that uh, the paint came down with enough force to almost break her neck. Uh, apparently it like, sprayed her neck, hurt the hell out of her. Forced black paint all up her nose and stuff and filled her sinuses with black paint that was coming out over the next few days. And she said it was an awful, awful, painful experience. It sounds like. Yeah, it, it did not sound good. And I mean, of all the ways to go, you know. Right, Elvira like, dies, have black paint dumped on her head. I mean, it's like, you go about all the people who died on production. You know, you've got those, the Saigon person who got killed by the helicopter. And then you got Elvira who got killed by paint. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, up at actor movie heaven it's like how'd you die well alec baldwin shot me how'd you die paint yeah alec baldwin shot me <laughs> uh, never make out Al- alec baldwin angry he'll yeah, arrange right. so he'll arrange so this real bullet in there and then waste you from across the room yeah all of a sudden you just get ma- a letter in the mail you're like wow i thought i really pissed off alec baldwin but he wants me to be in his new movie with him to make up oh that's sweet of him it's a western huh hmm uh-oh. Yeah, or uh-oh. At the end of the movie, there's a scene where she's about to get burned at the stake by the uh, Falwell townsfolk. Yes, the town that she shows up in is called Falwell after Jerry Falwell, who apparently really hated El- Elvira. Of course he did. Of course he did. He hates everything. At least public doesn't make money. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, he, yeah. Well, this scene actually had real fall- fire all around her, and she had to be soaked in fire retardant to prevent her from going up in flames. This made her clothes incredibly itchy, which sucked because her hands were like tied behind her back for this entire scene. So she couldn't scratch herself and was just completely miserable. Also, the retardant smelled like paint thinner and to top it off, it was also cold and rainy. So since it was like real flames, she was either cold, wet and miserable or they would light the fire around her and she'd be hot, wet and miserable. (laughs) 
Yeah, she was like, that was a horrible scene. Don't ever do a scene where they set you on fire or you're around fire because mm. the movie premiered on September 30th, 1988, which Cassandra says was the best and worst day of her life. Good day because the movie premiered. Yay. It was a bad day because her father also was diagnosed with bone cancer that day. Boo. That's a movie. Did he have to home. tell her the same day? You know, like, give her a day. Well, what happened is her parents uh, hopped in the Winnebago and traveled down to L.A. for the premiere of the show. And when they showed up, her dad had like a massive headache. It was like, ah, my neck and my head hurts. And Cassandra was like, well, I'm going to send you my chiropractor. He's got an opening. And she, he went to the chiropractor and chiropractor was like, go to the doctor right now. I can't help with this. You need to get checked out. So he immediately went to the doctor, got an x-ray. And the doctor was like, you got bone cancer. So Yay. yeah, apparently it all happened like super fast. And yeah. So uh, yeah, I guess they could have saved it for the next day. <laughs> Well, but I mean, if it was incidental, that's... Remember, hon, how you're saying yesterday was the best day of your life? Well, well guess what, honey? Guess what? I, I, we could decide if we wanted the best day and the worst day to be two separate things or lump them together. I don't know. Sort of like if you have Christmas and uh, your birthday back to back. So the movie was the number three grossing film behind Punchline with Tom Hanks and Gorillas in the Mist with Sigourney Weaver. I've never seen either of those movies. I know of them, though. I know of Punchline. Um... I remember the cover from the uh, video store that I worked at. I've seen clips. Uh, What was the other one? Gorillas in the Mist with Sigourney Weaver. Okay, I've never seen that one. Yeah, that was the one where she played Jane Goodall, I believe, and went out there and had orgies with monkeys. Yeah, and I I never get, like, because she said, I I remember seeing interviews, like, people say, asking, like, they asked if I had, you know, intercourse with the monkeys. (laughs) My thing is, like, she's never given a clear, definitive look at the camera. No. (laughs) <laughs> this is you know, very true. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember any kind of like interview where this is it's addressed or whatever. And she just very clearly, concisely looks dead set in the camera and says, "I did not have sex with monkeys." Yeah. No. Nope. Every time they ask her, she just points it to her OnlyFans account and is like, "Check that <laughs> out to know." <laughs> Despite the movie being doing well, it was un- unceremoniously pulled from theaters after just a few weeks. Why do you ask? Well, you didn't ask, but I'm going to tell you anyways, Nate. Well, the movie was produced by NBC subsidiary New World Pictures, which was, side note, founded by Roger Corman. So the heads of this company were actually being investigated for racketeering and fraud. And this led theaters to believe that the studio would be shut down any day and the theaters wouldn't get their money from the movie being shown. So uh, most theaters were just like, hey, if we're not going to make our money back from this, uh, they just pulled the movie from the screens to free it up for other stuff. Because I guess... I don't know. I guess the way it's set up is the theaters don't get their money until afterwards from the studio. Oh, it's uh, kind of weird and funny, but yeah, basically the theaters are like, Hey, this company's going under, or this studio's going under. So we're not going to get our money back from Elvira showings. Didn't make sense to me, but also I'm not in the theater industry. So hmm. yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. And also too, this is the eighties. Things might've changed it before you're, uh, since you're in the theaters. Also a factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, right. a lot of changes it's over like, the years. Back in the day, they used to send a, a guy with a Tommy gun to make sure that all that the, huh. they got their cut. Yep. Yeah. See. Yeah, we're here for movie money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, Where's I cut the, the I, I cut the Bugs Bunny. Uh, huh. Whereas the public liked the movie, critics largely hated it. For, you know, it's not a very critic-friendly movie. Of course they did, because yeah. they're assholes. Yep. It, like She said it the was... one that hurt was Roger Ebert, because Roger Ebert was a huge Elvira fan, but absolutely hated the movie. Well, fuck that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I lost my respect for him with the, when the whole, like, video game thing happened. Because I, I was working at a video game store. I like video games. Um, I think, uh, now, obviously not all video games. Pac-Man is in exactly, you know, a story-rich uh, environment you know but like you can't tell you can't play the last of us and then turn around and tell me that video games don't like do a story and aren't art did you, you ever know? hear his explanation on why he said that um because he's an asshole basically in his mind in order for it to be art it has to be one consistent experience that a person can experience over and over again video games you can alter the outcome you can alter the flow you can alter the pacing of it and you can make it somewhat different from the original uh, creator's intentions of the story sort of thing. You, and yes he and said no. That, yes and no, mm-hmm. but like, yes and no, but it, sure. Like, 
not every, but the, it's not like it's random. You know, you don't play in a video, you don't pop in a video game and it's like, oh, you'll either, you know, save the princess or, I don't know, you turn to a sheep and then eat grass and explode. You know, like, if, huh. there's, there's, you just make a Warcraft reference from like 1995. Yeah. <laughs> what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> I started. I started pulling quick, quick an analogy now, 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 and then all of a sudden, of Warcraft. And th- the thing is, like each one of those things, I literally pulled out of my ass individually. It wasn't one complete thought. It was three complete random things that happened to equal out of Warcraft. <laughs> <laughs> Warcraft uh, P tier Griffin. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> exactly what just happened. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, there everything that happened was intended to happen, and so. You know, even with multiple endings, you know the people who designed that game design those those endings. It's not random. You you get the endings that you get. Now the one ending very well could be I suck at this game. I can't finish it. So the ending is whatever the ending happened to be. Wherever you stopped. So, but even then, it's like I don't know if you walk into a painting and you glance at it, then walk away. Did you actually did that painting work or not work? Was it art now because you don't give a fuck about it? Like we went to Chicago to the to the art museum there, and there was legitimately there was a painting there that was just black, just black. There's yeah. no paint. I'm like, this is it, is it art because the guy couldn't like do more than black. I don't know. Yeah, but I, as the same token, if you walk up there and put a big white stripe across it, you change the original artist's intention of that painting. Very sure. Yeah. Right, I mean, I kind of get what uh, Roger Ebert's getting at, but I don't agree with him, but I kind of get what he's getting at. I Fair enough. I'll give you that. I yeah. I can see what he's talking he's about. He's entitled to that opinion, even if it's wrong, I guess is what I'm saying. And he's dead now, so fuck him. He, yeah, he is dead. Yeah. Can't bring, get him in here for an interview with his half face. Yeah. I was say with his creepy flopping jaw. <laughs> uh, the most disturbing short film of all time. Roger Ebert eating soup. Oh my God. That'd be <laughs> awful. So for the movie, uh, the Elvira movie, Cassandra earned herself a Razzie Award for Worst Performance by an Actress for the movie. Ironically, that same year, she also earned the Saturn Award for Best Actress on her TV show. She, the Duality of Elvira. Did she go pick it up herself? Uh, uh, the Razzie? The Razzie, yeah. Uh, I would just pr- probably. I think a lot of those people do show up for their awards, don't they? No, a lot of people don't. That's why oh, it's... Really? That, no, what, I mean, because it's... Who wants to go accept an award for their worst actress? Now, Halle Berry famously went and got her Okay, that's, that's exactly my first thought. I was like, well, Halle Berry went, so probably other people do. I, I mean, hey, an award's an award. Well, again, though, who wants to, who, who wants to celebrate you know, failure? As was kind of the time with theater flops, the movie did better in VHH sales than it did in the theater, and reportedly at one point was in the top 60 selling VHS tapes of all time. When it premiered on NBC in 1990, it earned NBC their highest ratings of the year for that time slot. So, people did like that movie, just hmm, didn't really get a chance in the theaters too, which kind of sucked. To help hype this movie on release, Brandon Tartikoff went to SNL's Lauren Michaels, that's Saturday Night Live's Lauren Michaels, and said, hey, Let's put Elvira on as host so she can hype her movie. Let's do this for a Halloween episode. Lauren Michaels refused because he did not like the Elvira character in the least. Brandon Tartikoff flexed his rank and got Elvira on the show, but it turned out to be a nightmare for Elvira because uh, Lauren Michaels did everything in his power to make that appearance miserable for her. Not wanting uh, Elvira to have the spotlight, he made her co-host the episode with Dabney Coleman, who's very much not a Halloween kind of guy. And also, the, sk- the skits that are written for Elvira... Uh, basically, Lauren Michaels was like, no, she's not doing that skit anymore. We're giving this Dabney Coleman, which I don't know if you remember Dabney Coleman, but he was kind of like one of those more serious comedic actors, sort of. Uh, also, another see. thing, too, uh, Lauren would actually berate, uh, find ways to berate Elvira one way or another, and even demanding she give up her Valley Girl accent and talk normally. Uh, which I kind of... Okay, so here's the thing. I was like, does she really have a Valley Girl accent? And nowadays, not so much her character, but I went back to some of the early interviews and she really laid that Valley Girl accent on thick at times and kind of annoying, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Yeah, way back when she was more like, yeah, I'm like, you know, the, uh, like, queen of Halloween and stuff. Yeah, a lot, you know, a lot more of that kind of stuff. Okay. Almost a little more, like, baby time. Yeah, it was kind of a little more annoying. She has toned it down since then, so. Man, I mean, I've never, let me be real, I've never been a fan of Lauren Michaels. I've never been against him either. I yeah, just, I don't, I've I never heard a good shit story about really, him. Yeah, one way or the other. You know, a lot of these like ho- 
these people who are powerful like that, um, you know, a lot of times they'll come across as dicks because you know they are. Yeah. But <laughs> I mean, just just doing that. Why? Why would you do that? And it, especially since it's SNL, it'd be one thing. Like, oh, we you know, this limited run we had for you know whatever. But it's SNL. It's one one episode out of all of them. Yeah. And, you know, one of these people is going to be remembered forever. One of these people. I mean, I looked at, I did a quick search, and I mean, he's not unknown. Like, I, he he has definitely been in things. So, like, I saw yeah. his face. I'm like, oh, okay. Back he's in the 80s, excellent. he was definitely bigger than he was any time. Absolutely. Else, but Elvira's, like, timeless. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, she's not going to be starring. That'd be re- let's all be real. You know, she's not about to go and have. She's not going to be the star in the Ten Commandments remake. Yeah, or anything like yeah. That. She her oh, career, let my people go, and the Goths just storm out of Egypt. <laughs> her career as an actress is pretty much over. However, like the iconography of Elvira will last. You know, long after she's dead. This would also be Elvira's only appearance on SNL. Sad times. Side note from this appearance, though. During rehear- one of the rehearsals, her friend from the Groundlings, Phil Hartman, pulled Cassandra aside, and he proudly pulled out an engagement ring and showed it to her. He was going to propose to his girlfriend, Bryn. Several years later, checking in on her friend, uh, Phil Hartman, he would be like, Bryn has made me the happiest man in the world. I am so happy I married her. If I died tomorrow, I would be a die a happy man. Three days later, Bryn would murder him in a cocaine field psychosis. I would say, well, it would be too good if it was the next day. I mean, it's really his his passing is awful. Like I he I really did. I thoroughly loved him. He it, almost everything he did. Yeah, I, I liked mean, him so, too. Some people didn't like him so much though. There were some people like Jimmy Lord just like, meh. Really? I mean, it's yeah. I guess to each their own. I mean, I I'm not gonna go so far as say he's be fa- my favorite. Um, I'm just but not. he's Lionel Hutz, and that's all that really yeah, matters. Yeah, he. He is definitely one of my favorites. Yeah, uh, I liked him in everything he was in. I found him entertaining. 1989 would see the first of four Elvira pinball machines to be released. I remember playing one of them and really liking it, but I don't remember which one it is. But if you want a uh, the OG pinball machine, you can buy them used on eBay for 6500 bucks. And uh, the most recent pinball machine, the 40th anniversary one, is 35000 bucks brand new if you want it. Pinball machines, expensive. That's why you don't see them very often anymore. 1989 would also see Elvira making a guest appearance on the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, the show we all know and love. Uh, I remember that show being able to watch it occasionally back as a kid. I hated the live action, but loved the cartoon parts. Now, as an adult, I don't really like the cartoon parts that much, but the live action is gold stuff. 1989, Cassandra would purchase Briarcliff Manor in California, a mansion that was built in 1910 by a reclusive oil baron and later turned into a Scientology center and looked like a cool haunted house. I mentioned this because at one point she invited Mark Hamill over to the place to hang out. And when he arrived, he says, oh, yeah, I used to live here when it was a college dorm and I was going to college down the road. Yeah, I had to move out after my roommate killed himself. Come here, I'll show you which room it was in and drug her up to a closet. It was like he hung himself right there. I don't know if he said it really excitedly, but I kind of like to think he was <laughs> all excited. Just like, hey, come, here, come here, come here, come here. Look right there. Right there is where I found his corpse hanging. Can you, sm- uh, can you smell the death? Uh, yeah. It's still here. Ah, <laughs> uh, Yes, I can still smell that shit that was in his pants. I guess at 1.2, it was also a Scientology center. Also, when they bought the property, it had a bunch of, like, birds just wandering around on it because the previous owners were kind of weird, just let animals wander around and do their thing. Cassandra had said she became great friends with all the pet turkeys that were there. They would follow her around, like, little pets and this and that, and she could, like, pet them, and they just did turkey things. Because turkeys are kind of cool that way. She also learned, too, that uh, if you let turkeys eat all they can, they will eat themselves to death, and all her pet turkeys ate themselves to death. Nice. Yeah. She also I heard goldfish chickens- the same thing. Uh, yep. She also didn't know that uh, chickens could fly too, and uh, the neighbors were getting all pissy that all the chickens were like flying over their house and shitting, and then flying back. So she's like, "We have a fence. Obviously, chickens can't get out, but yes, they can. Chickens can fly. They're not great flyers, but they can fly. Yeah, they're not. So you're not looking up like, look at the majestic yeah. soaring chicken up there. Although what they can do is they can sort of like uh, quote unquote wall jump their way up a couple of trees, and once they get to the top of the trees, they can kind of like tree hop from the top of them and. Almost, quote-unquote, soar majestically. Almost. So, uh, apparently, as Elvira learned, though, when you buy, or Cassandra learned, when you buy an old, giant mansion house, it the repairs and upkeep are way too expensive to make it worthwhile. So, in the 90s, she sold it to Brad Pitt. Nice. And Brad, yeah, Brad Pitt still owns it to this day, I believe, and Elvira just moved just down the road a couple of houses, I believe. Or maybe he moved, she moved next door. 
Because I think Brad Pitt later tried to buy that house off of her too, so he could like make one big lot. Anyways, there we go. Brad Pitt owns uh, Elvira's old house. Yay. Yeah. So we're now in the 90s, and the Elvira role was still going strong for her. And now she's doing a lot of activism work, mainly in the realm of HIV and AIDS awareness, but she also became a PETA's anti-fur spokeswoman. I wonder if she was still traumatized from that rabbit coat thing from before. I remember when the homeless person was jacking off into a rabbit fur coat? Yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, that does sound familiar. Yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, so when she was a PETA uh, spokesperson, which uh, I, I agree with PETA's statements on, you know, treat animals better, but I don't like that company. They do some real shady stuff. Oh, dude, they do super shady stuff. And especially, yeah. I, I especially love how they're like, oh, yeah, you know, boo animal cruelty. Da, 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 da. Meanwhile, they like kill more animals than almost yep. any other animal, like anything. Yes, they do. They have like mass kill shelters. One time she hosted a PETA celebrity dinner at, at her place. And among the attendees were Melissa Etheridge, Katie Lang, and Katie Seagal of Married with Children fame. And also River Phoenix was there. And she mainly remembers River Phoenix for one thing. Uh, one, he showed up late and uh, brought along all his buddies and uh, brothers and stuff, and they didn't have enough seats, so that was kind of annoying. But apparently, Cassandra made this great, beautiful pumpkin casserole that she brought out for the uh, group and set it in the middle of the table for the guests. And River, like, walked over, stuck his head over, and looked down, and his big, hairy, gross, uh, greasy beanie fell right off into the dish. So I'd turn around and head right back to the kitchen and start picking all the fuzz and hair and crap out of it. Oh, man, I'd be so pissed. Yeah, she <laughs> she was not impressed with that. She was really annoyed. But she was like, turns out he was a really sweet kid. And at the end of the uh, night, he gave her a big old hug and apologized for it. It was like, sorry, I did that for you. And basically, everything was fine. And then he died. Later, yeah, I was just about to say, later, River Phoenix would die. Does Elvira, like, some sort of black widow? She just kills people she doesn't intend to. <laughs> she like after she hugs River Phoenix, he dies. Maybe hugs uh gives uh Phil Hartman a hug, he dies. Mm. It's like, give me a hug. No. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I've seen what happened to these other people. 1993. She uh Cassandra films a uh, pilot for CBS called the Elvira Show. It was kind of an expansion on the 1988 film with, but with a sitcom setting. And this would be of a young witch who would move in with her two witch ants and their talking black cat. One of the ants would be played by Elvira, and they would be dealing with nosy neighbors and uptight conservatives who wanted them to move out all the while they tried to hide the fact that they were all witches. This show was not picked up by CBS, but you can find it on YouTube, and, you know, it's all right. It is what it is. I don't think it would have made it, but... It's Sabrina. It, yeah, pretty much. No, not pretty much. It's Sabrina. It, <laughs> down from the beginning to the end. You have this girl living in a, a house with her two aunts who are witches with a black cat that can talk in one series. And there's the newer one. The cat doesn't talk for whatever reason. I mean, oh, it's... Boo. That talking cat was the best part of Sabrina because he was a right? cracker one. Right. Yeah. No, it, was I, like, it was like the only thing I liked about that show. Well, that I mean, means I, Joan Hart was hot, but you know. Yeah. I mean, I never really... I didn't have cable, so I couldn't really watch it. But like, I did watch it some. Yeah, I saw some. I saw clips and stuff, but yeah, and then they the more recent one where it's like she's the more I blah, 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 blah. the more recent one they try to ground in quote unquote reality, and so like they were literally worshiping Satan. And oh, I know were, which one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, that they tried to be like a serious cat, teen drama kind of thing. Yeah, and that cat did not talk. Which I, again, like you just said, the best part of the original show was a talking cat. It so was. why, of all the things to remove, you removed that bit? During the casting process for the show, it was down to two actresses for the role of Elvira's niece, Phoebe and Hillary. They went with Phoebe, but many years later, Elvira would run into Hillary again and ask her, "Hey, what's up, Hillary? I remember interviewing for it. You been up to anything?" And Hillary would say, "Oh, you know, I just won an Oscar for this movie called Boys Don't Cry." Yes, it was Hillary Swank who auditioned for the part and failed. Cassandra says Hillary owes her one for not hiring her and ruining her career before it started. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, all these actors, be yeah, grateful I didn't hire you. It like, if oh. it wasn't for me, I had my bad casting decisions. She actually says that in the book. She's like, my bad casting decisions made for a lot of good films later on. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're like, all the people who did get the part, they're like, well, what about us? Like, sorry, yeah, right? but, sorry I man, apologize. I ruined your career. <laughs> exactly. The show tested really well, and the president of CBS practically guaranteed the show to be picked up. However, unfortunately, even someone up higher in the uh, CBS chain saw the Elvira pilot in her skimpy outfit and said, we will not have that kind of smut on CBS, blah. Yeah, apparently they were just like, we don't want like a half-dressed middle-aged woman doing a thing on TV. 
dumb, yes. However, next year, CBS would release their hit Sabrina the Teenage Witch, a young witch who'd move in with her two witch ants and their talking black cat. Elvira feels really cheated by that because apparently, yep. Like you said, same exact show, just a year apart. 1994, at the age of 43, Cassandra gave birth to her first and only child, Sadie. Congrats on that. Shortly after that, in 1995, Playboy came calling and offered her $1 million to pose nude for the magazine. That is the most they ever offered somebody, and it equaled the other time they offered it the most money. The only other time they offered a person that much money was Farrah Fawcett, who they also offered a million bucks to. And boy, howdy, did Cassandra want that money. She really, really did. But uh, she was kind of still a little bit iffy on whether she should do it or not, so she went to a convention and flowed the idea, and the fans actually talked her out of it. They said uh, seeing Elvira nude would kind of ruin the mystery and allure of her being like the mysterious queen of Halloween. And uh, yeah, Cassandra agreed, and I kind of agree with him on that too. Yeah, I, I yeah. give you. I mean, as much as as much as my like little thirteen year old boy self inside of me is like, no boobies. Uh, if I yeah. if I if I have to see boobies, I it's a a few keystrokes away. You know, it I it's fine. Well, she was still deciding on the Playboy offer, though. She decided now was a good time to get into shape uh, after. Her- post childbirthing days. So she went to a gym, got a membership and a personal trainer. While at this gym, Cassandra notices one super hot dude working out. Just her style. He had long hair, muscles, tattoos, brooding energy. Cassandra immediately got the hots for him. Then much into much to her surprise, they ran to each other in a women's restroom. Holy smokes, that's not a guy, that's a gal, she thought to herself. Am I sexual am I sexually attracted to women, Cassandra thought? Am I gay? The answer is yes. And this lady she met at the gym would be her future partner after her and her husband would get divorced. But we'll come back to that later. So, in the meantime, though, while all that was going on, Cassandra and her husband manager decided that maybe it's time for another Elvira movie. Uh, It's been 10 years since the last one. We're in the late 90s right now. And they decided that since the first movie was a VHS success and never really got its chance in the theaters, time to uh, strike while the iron is hot, so to speak. So plans were put in motion to make an Elvira movie that spoofed the old Roger Corman movies of the 50s. Why wouldn't that be a hit? First of all, Cassandra and her husband decided to bypass studios and finance the movie themselves because they wanted those big bucks. Turned out to be way more expensive to make a movie than they anticipated, so to cut costs, instead of shooting in America, they went to Romania and got a bunch of non-union workers and the such. Also, the city had the uh, area they were filming in kind of had the look they needed so they didn't, you know, have to do any set design and this and that. And it's just significantly cheaper to shoot over there. And they were able to put the... uh, Movie together for one million dollars, which is a lot less than the first movie, which cost thirteen million. So, significantly cheaper to shoot in Romania. It sounds like yeah, yeah, right. It's like that million bucks for a movie sounds dirt cheap, no matter what you're doing, really. For the casting of the movie, they actually tried to get Christopher Lee hired because she remembers him from being those old corny uh, horror movies from back in the day that you even referenced earlier. Uh, so they reached out to uh, Christopher Lee's agent, and he responded. Huh, Christopher Lee doesn't do those kind of movies anymore. Look elsewhere. So, Slap. yeah, yeah, basically. They threw him Hail Mary and tried to also get Mick Jagger in the movie. That did not happen either. Along the casting lines, for the hunky male lead to play opposite Elvira, the only guy they could find that checked all the boxes being big, hunky, studly-looking dude, he couldn't speak a lick of English, so they decided to write it as a joke, and they dubbed his voice very, very poorly, like completely out of sync, and uh, they actually acknowledged it in the movie, like, it was just really bad dubbing and Elvira would just be like staring at his mouth and be like, how is he doing that? That's actually kind of a funny joke. For the voiceover, they got Rob Paulson, who was a uh, Yakko and Pinky from Animaniacs and Raphael from the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and a million other things. Oh, nice. The dub over voice. Yeah. We've talked about him in a few other episodes. I watched the movie. It's not good, though, sadly. It's got a couple all right scenes, but. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it felt like a really bad uh, Mel Brooks knockoff kind of thing. Like, hey, we're going to make a Mel Brooks movie without any of the charm or humor. At the yeah, end of this movie, yeah, though, yeah. there's one scene where Elvira is tied to a table, a la the pit and the pendulum, and this giant blade swings down closer and closer and closer to her, and at the last minute, it's supposed to cut through the ropes because, you know, her the ropes are, like, tied to her breasts, and her breasts are so tall, it actually, like, lifts her up, so the ropes cut first. So this scene was originally supposed to be done by a stunt double due to the fact that it involved an actual real blade cutting through the ropes and was actually kind of a dangerous stunt. However, when the stunt double showed up, she was flat as a board in the chesticle region, and uh, no matter the prosthetics that they tried to use, they could not make it look good, and it just looked ridiculous. So, lacking time and a budget, Cassandra was like, you know what? I'll do this scene. 
And she said, as she laid there watching that blade move slower and slower towards her, uh, all she could think is, boy, uh, boy I hope these uh, Romanian non-union workers know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and I can agree with her on that. If my life is on the line in a situation like that, I promise you I want nothing less than hardworking, salt-of-the-earth, homegrown Japanese people because they know precision precision engineering, Nate. Yes, they do. Did Elvira? Yeah, they do. Did Elvira get killed with the stunt? Well, no, it actually went off kind of without a hitch, but she did get a cut on her breast that they had to cover up with makeup for the rest of the shoot. So she didn't get out unscathed. Little cut. The actual scene, too, she actually, like, the blade actually does come down. She has, like, heave her chest up and it cuts through the rope and she's got to, like, roll out the last minute. It wasn't a nothing stunt, to be honest. It could have gone very wrong. Especially the real blade. I mean... Yeah, I mean, apparently she was like, yeah, it was like a hundred pound blade or something like that. They're just like, ah, we're doing it this way. There had to be a better way. I mean, obviously they did it. It's all over, but still. Well, yeah, that's probably why it only cost a million dollars is because they're like, well, we have this old blade from Vlad the Impaler we can use. <laughs> Sold. During the shooting of this movie, though, two bad things happened. Cassandra got walking pneumonia, bad, and her husband manager Mark was becoming a nightmare, worse. He was being rude to the cast, alienating them, pissing everybody off, and he was also constantly berating Cassandra in front of the crew, like just like calling around, just screaming at her over like nothing kind of stuff. Uh, she said it's very awkward too to just stand there and be yelled at by your husband over nothing while the entire crew just watches. So, eh, not good times there. Right. Opening opening night proceeds of the movie were donated to local AIDS charities in whatever city they was opening in. So, you know, if it was opening in Seattle, uh, all the proceeds from the opening night went to the, the local AIDS charities in Seattle, or so on and so forth. Nice. Yeah. However, the movie was not very successful. They didn't even come close back to making their money. And Cassandra says, through this experience, she very much advises to never finance your own movie. Uh, uh, that makes sense, to be honest. Yeah, um, I saw it. it I, there was a movie... Uh, I, you know what? It doesn't even matter what it was called. But um, oh man, I'm telling totally, why I hate this with my name with names. Oh god, uh, a, mo- a a director actually like financed the whole thing with his own and he with his own money. Uh, Mel Brooks, Mel Brooks financed the whole movie, and you wouldn't know it would not know as Mel Brooks as it has to because this was not a funny movie. Uh, it was like some like sci fi movie with a bunch of fucking kids. Uh, huh. Rick Moranis was part of it. Um, anyway, it was a terrible movie. It went out there. He actually like mortgaged his house and he was in real trouble if it didn't sell. And so he actually ended up selling it and he got all, he made just enough money to get out of it completely. He like, he paid off the is the mortgage he did. He paid that off. He paid off anybody he borrowed money from and he may, he may have made like five bucks. You no, know? And he just, but he, no, he was like, woo. Okay. Huh. Like, yeah, right? no, making he, five bucks is better than losing money. Oh yeah, he, he's he walked out of there with a lesson. He's like, never finance your own movie. Yeah, that was his big. That was the one thing he did. Like I said, I mean, yeah, it, it didn't turn out profitable, but he could not have been happier how he got out of that. <laughs> it's like I'm done. <laughs> fuck yeah, this, right. Fuck this. <laughs> it's like just barely missing a fatal automobile accident. Be like, well, the signs on the wall. As for her marriage to Mark Pearson, that ended in 2003. What started out as a good relationship eventually devolved due to Mark becoming mentally and emotionally abusive. Explosive yeah. outbursts out of nowhere. Hmm? It was like, yeah, it sounds like. I mean, yeah, talking yeah. about screaming at her and stuff. I mean, I'd leave him too. Yep. He would berate her out of nowhere for things that she wasn't even aware of. He also became controlling with the money, refusing to let her purchase things while buying whatever the hell he wanted at any time. Basically, yeah, she'd be like, hey, can I, you know, get a new dress? She'd be like, no, but I bought all these guitars for myself kind of stuff. Oh, what a dick. Yeah, right. Uh, she knew it was time to move on when they attended couples therapy and Mark spent the entire session berating Cassandra in, st- in front of the therapist. When the therapist tried to get him to let Cassandra talk, he wouldn't and kept on yelling uh, to the point where the therapist just had to end the uh, session early because he's like, well, this ain't working. Must have been an awkward drive home after that. Well, With I mean, power- awkward, <laughs> but also just she's just, you know, obviously she got the message, you know. Yeah. The, ther- the ther- therapy absolutely worked. Yeah, it, it yeah, helped right. the show. Hey, she gave it a shot, and uh, it showed her what she needed to know. Yay, yep. therapy. With the power of hindsight after the divorce, she had realized that uh, he was essentially her mother in the way he abused her. You know, just the constant berating, and never, I don't know if it ever got physical, but she was just like, well, I suddenly realized that while the relationship was abusive, uh, there was some familiarity there, because the relationship reminded me of the relationship I had with my mother. So, yeah. And that's kind of part of the reason. Yeah, that's a story that's, you know, old as time, I think. 
when you grow up in like a situation that's a two out of 10 and then you move up to a four out of 10, you're like, hey, this is twice as good. This is way better, but you're still at a four out of 10. So, right. Um, yeah. Everything's relative to where you've been, I guess. Precisely. Yep. And the divorce, he got all the money, but she got to keep the rights to the character and her pension plan in the divorce. That's kind of long and the short of it. Well, that's, and at the age that's of crappy because it'd be she should have kept it anyway. It, yeah, right. Yeah, well, he was the manager, I guess. So there was some of that there. I, I don't know. We could talk to yeah. the yeah, I, yeah that's for just, the lawyers to talk about. Yeah, fuck that guy. Yeah, yeah, fuck him. So, anyways, now that she is done with her mark, she decides to uh, give a shot with the relationship with that trainer that she saw at the gym, who is called T. In fact, that's uh, the only thing that we have a reference to. She tries to keep very quiet about her uh, personal life nowadays. Actually, she's kind of quiet about her personal life right, right up until this book, to be honest. But uh, basically, when they started their relationship, they weren't uh, they weren't in relationship at first. But her trainer and her, you know, they got along. They're really good friends. And after the divorce, uh, the trainer moved in to help her watch the kids and, you know, this and that, because the trainer also got out of a bad relationship. So on and so forth. And then next thing you know, hey, guess what? We're in a relationship together. Her and T, Cassandra and T. <laughs> they sound like they were just, you know, woke up one morning like, ah, oh, they're in bed, kiss each other. They start making breakfast and all of a sudden, like, like so it sits up real quickly. Like, Holy shit, we're in a relationship together. <laughs> huh. Uh, actually, apparently, the way it worked out is they were just kind of like having a day out, just hanging out and stuff. And then when they got back to their place, uh, Elvira was like, or Cassandra was like, I just wanted to kiss her for reasons I couldn't understand. And so she did. And they're like, ooh, now we're a couple. Middle school, high five. I guess. <laughs> yeah. <High> five, <laughs> Dude, <laughs> that was awesome. Shaw. Fist bump. Woo. Uh, Cassandra, for the longest time, like up until this book, for almost 20 years, kept that relationship, uh, her gay relationship secret because she thought the anti-gay backlash would actually help the, hurt the Elvira character. Because all of a sudden she realized, be like, hey, guys won't be interested in Elvira if they find out she's gay. Uh, and you can kind of understand the train of thought because she comes from that era where, you know, if you come out as gay, it just destroys your career, no matter what right. your career is. Yeah. Uh, turns out, though, this train of thought was completely wrong. And when she finally admitted to the relationship in her book, everyone was super duper supportive, as you would imagine. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fine. Yeah. Also, I kind of get the feeling, you know, as far as movie genre fans, horror movie fans might be some of the more open minded fans, fan base out there. I think you're you're like action or Westerns or this or that. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here's a fun side fact. The Elvira costume is the best selling female Halloween costume of all time. Unsurprised. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised either. I mean, because it's iconic. You know, and yeah, I mean, it's and just... it's cheap to produce too. I'd imagine because it's just like one little sheet of polyester, right? I mean, yeah, it's not exactly you, you a, do your elaborate own, like, costume. You can either make your own or. And also on that note, if you do buy an official Elvira costume, so that money goes to Cassandra because she owns the rights to the character. Yeah, want to support Elvira? Buy her actual licensed stuff. Is all I'm saying. Yep. Do it because un- unlike a lot of people where they just get like a penny out of it, she actually gets the full amount, which four pennies. I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea how licensing works. In September 2010, Elvira's movie Macabre returned to pub- returned to television syndication, this time with public domain films. This uh, run of the series was actually paid for Cassandra's own out of Cassandra's own pocket, and she said to remaster these movies, even though the movies were like uh, public domain and free to get the movie, to remaster them so they were watchable cost about $10,000 for each movie. Uh, she made 26 episodes of this, but only 20 aired. So I guess we could... Say, let's see, 26 times 10,000. 26,000? Yes. <laughs> uh, 26 episodes made, only 20 aired, and uh, she hopes she learns her lesson about self-financing this time because she took a big old loss on this one as well. She's like, yeah. apparently I didn't learn my lesson the first time, and second time went just about the same. Lay whoops. But hey, at least she gave it a shot. 2014, we get 13 Nights of Elvira which was produced for Hulu by Brainstorm Media. Um, uh, basically, this was another thing where she would line up and uh, review movies, bad movies. But the majority of these were uh, full moon feature movies. And if you don't remember them, they were like the ones who did the OG Puppet Master movies and those guys back in the 80s. Yeah. They also did Evil Bong starring Tommy Chong. Evil Bong? Evil Bong starring Tommy Chong. Oh, yep, there you go. That, that is a new mo- uh, full moon features movie. It does not look good from what I saw. 
So does the bong itself kill you, or does it make you make the bong like make you turn evil? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll have to watch it. All I know is the cover of the box has a very evil looking bong and Tommy Chong on it. Well, there and you Chong go. and bong rhyme. Yay! Yay! Elvira's 40th anniversary, very scary, very special special, came out in 2021. This was to celebrate the original show's 40th anniversary, a special one-night movie marathon which premiered live on Shudder, the horror streaming service. Uh, the special came out September 25th, the same week as her uh, memoir, Yours Cruelly, Elvira. Oh, by the way, just so everybody knows, pretty much eh, 90% of the info, 85% of the info of this is from her biography. Elvira, your, or wait, yours cruelly, Elvira. That's her memoir. I recommend it. Good book. Go check it out. And I didn't want to just like use that book as a source, so I went back and found old articles on her and old interviews. So, yay. Awesome. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah. And uh, two of the movies that they did for that uh, streaming thing on Shudder, uh, the first movie they did was Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, her movie from 1988, and also the original horror movie that she first saw, House on Haunted Hill, which, again, I stand by. Not a bad movie. So now we're kind of winding down in the last few years. And uh, as of 2018, Cassandra says she's in talks for both a sequel to Mistress of the Dark and an Elvira animated series, but have not really had any word since then. So maybe stuck in production hell. Let's see, 2021. Was that? She, she, she should go animated. Yeah, yeah, she should. I mean, uh, she still looks great. Don't get me wrong. She still looks great. But... In fact- I think she's even also, in one of her interviews, she actually did say she wants to go animated because that will keep it, you know. Yeah, basically, your physicality can only last so long, but animated can go forever. Yeah, because it's still her voice. Like, her voice is also, her voice is just as iconic as her figure. Yeah, it really so, is. So, I mean, if she, I think she still could. Like, if she went on there and pulled it off, I think she, you know, from what I've seen of her recently, I think she could probably do okay. But that's, it's just nature. You know, just, she's, Get up there in years. Yeah. And so, yeah, she's in her 70s now. So, 72. That is no spring chicken. She might only have a good 30 years left in front of her. Yeah, she could take care of herself. Hopefully, she yeah. didn't, you know, unless she something sneaks up on her or. <laughs> ha. Uh, all right. Let's see. Where was I? Ba-doop, ba-doop, ba-doop. I got sidetracked because my brain was like, oh, crap, there's something I forgot to add in here. Oh, yeah. God, when was that? At one point, they did actually have a little mini series, whereas uh, I think it was like on VH1 or something, where it's fine, the next Elvira and a bunch of is a reality show where a bunch of people got to show up and, you know, show off their Elvira skills. And uh, the plan on that was actually they kind of wanted to do like a Santa Claus thing where uh, every Halloween at a mall or whatever, they just have like regional Elvira show up and do their thing and hype up people and get them excited. Uh, that apparently fell through. Because, I don't know, I think people want to see the actual real Elvira. They don't want to see a fast simile. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that that's a good call. Yeah. 2022, Cassandra Peterson gets a role as a real estate agent in Rob Zombie's Munster movie that apparently was not that great. Actually, I've heard two train of thoughts on it. One, that movie's awful. Two, if you're a huge fan of the original Munster show, you probably would like it. Okay. Did that ever release? Yeah, it did. Oh, well, there you I, go. <laughs> yeah, I think it released on like, uh, it wasn't a, like a theatrical release, I don't think i think it just went to streaming they came out with a new like i saw a pilot episode for a new monster monsters um had oh, any insert in it uh was that the 1600 mockingbird lane one yeah whatever it's called oh that was that fine one, that was a while I actually, ago too yeah oh that was a while ago uh, yeah. i liked it you know it, it was actually it, that one got a lot of good reviews if i recall yeah it was it was pretty decent i don't know why they didn't go anywhere with it but uh because wasn't that more of kind of a serious and less wacky monsters or something. Yeah, I mean, it was still had its comedy to it, but it was more. Gotcha. It it yes, it was. I just more picture serious. some old studio head like watching, be like, "This isn't the monsters I remember." Ruff, 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 ruff. Get rid of this. Ruff, 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 ruff. Because I don't know, studio execs are just idiots sometimes. True. Sure. Yeah. So uh, basically, we're at modern day now, and outside of a lot of convention appearances the world over, she's mainly doing guest appearances and stuff at the moment. Uh, you know, little appearances on shows here, or there, podcasts. Uh, she does say she's enjoying life as much as ever in her seventies, and the relationship with T is easily the best she's ever had. She is completely in love with her and loving life. So good for you, Cassandra. I'm happy for you. Yay! Yay! Good for her. And we do have one last thing. 
while I was writing this up, I was like, hey, I could do something with all these characters. So now I present the oft off topic movie I concocted. We start with Elvira and John Waters as they hop into the macabre mobile and hit the road for adventure. Eventually, their car breaks down, but fortunately, there is the great Antonio there to pull him to the nearest mechanic. That mechanic is Mr. T, who repairs the macabre mobile and also turns into a war machine. All four now travel to Area 51, where they encounter Vetus, whose angelic falsetto and rhythmic tongue is able to communicate with the aliens. The five of them all drop acid and then watch the vivisection of a certain alien named Alf. The end. Yay. How high were you? When you wrote that. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Oh. <laughs> this is where the ending jingle goes. This is where the ending jingle goes. I don't know if we need one. I don't know if we'll get one. But if we do, then here is where it goes.